So I sort of uh, introduced the concept of autopoiesis in my last video to situate us a little bit differently before this problem of free will and determinism, um, to give us a new perspective of that dichotomy. And I wanted to do that because I think what we're faced with now in our day and age is this extreme sense either that we are free or we are determined. Um, sign, but no, no one person is able to take a side in this debate. Um, so it's not as though there are some who say, oh, everything's freely determined, and others who say um, that no, it's all determined. Even the most materialist scientist who wants to reduce all of nature to these discrete laws which can be mapped and then predicted, and so everything is basically um, going to happen already because it's just the computation of um, of these pieces, these forms, that uh, guides everything which occurs. Um, even they feel themselves to be alive and free and able to make decisions and to make choices and to like some things better than other things. Um, and that experience, they say, is irreducibly um, their own. So they feel as though they are people, and if they didn't feel that they were people, then we would have to lock them away. So all of us in our postmodern culture on the inside, as subjective beings, feel radically free. We're, all, we're, all, we're on the verge of, of inner apocalypse at all moments. And yet, on the outside, looking at society, we feel radically determined. And so we're very alienated from our experience in that sense, from our environment, from other people, from nature. And so, where does autopoiesis fit into all this? Well. This extreme distancing between free will and determinism, or, or this cognitive dissonance that it, that it twists our, our psyches into, is, is basically a product of the mind-body dualism, of the idea that I am not my body, that I hover above it, or I, um, you know, I'm somehow stored within it, but I'm not essentially required to have a body. And autopoiesis tells us that this is an illusion of our phenomenal experience. So phenomenology is the mm, scientific philosophy of using neuroscience and our understanding of the anatomy of the human being and applying it to first-person accounts of what that experiential state of being is like and trying to bridge the gaps. Um, so we're trying to build a bridge in phenomenology between first person and third person um, perspectives. Uh, and it seems to me that the only way to convey this this bridge is to also cultivate a, a second person perspective. And when we do phenomenology, what we're doing is we're looking for the essences of our experience. And that's why autopoiesis is aiming to find the, the essential qualities of life instead of just describing some of the functions of life or some of the um, characteristics of an organism, such as that it has metabolism or that it needs to eat and that it uh, excretes waste and, uh, you know, so on and so forth, that it can reproduce. These are all descriptions, um, these are all uh, side effects, symptoms of life, but we still haven't described life. So autopoiesis is going after life itself, and to do that we need to talk about essences. And I want to claim that those essences can only be found when we're taking a second person perspective. And, and I, a first person, Myself, the author of these words, can never convey a third-person objective um, truth about the world in itself without communicating effectively, without effectively assuming a second-person um, 
perspective because there's something interesting about second person perspectives they require the participation of not only myself but whoever's listening to me 